Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Ryan Mooney Bullock. I am the Executive Director of Green Umbrella and excited to have you with us tonight as we talk about the 2023 Green Cincinnati Plan with some people who know a lot about it because they have been intimately involved in the development um, and leadership of this plan. Uh, and are really um, leading on how we implement on it. So um, I'm going to introduce them, tell you a little bit about our time tonight, and then I will hand it over for, to them for a great conversation. Um, we are taking audience questions tonight, and so we encourage you to drop your questions as they come up in the Q&A. You know there's a Q&A section and a chat section, you wanna use the Q&A so we can easily grab those and add them to our list of questions to ask. Um, and then when we get to that time, I will um, ask the questions, uh, pose the questions to the team to figure out um, how we can approach them. So in case you don't know much about the Green Cincinnati Plan, we're gonna start off tonight with a explanation of what it is, why we have it for the city of Cincinnati, um, and we're going to hear that from the Office of Environment and Sustainability's director, Ollie Croner, who's with us tonight. We also have um, three elected official panelists with us, Council Member Mika Owens with the City of Cincinnati, Council Member Liz Keating with the City of Cincinnati, and joining us a little bit later will be Hamilton County Commissioner Denise Driehaus. And these folks have all um, been leading on the development and now the implementation of this plan. Green Umbrella is um, super excited about where we are today because for many reasons, one of which is that we were uh, deeply involved in the development of the Green Cincinnati Plan, both in terms of shaping some of the recommendations of the specific chapters, but really helping to think through how do we make sure that this plan can be developed in a way that truly captures community voice. And I'm sure Ollie will share some statistics with you later about the phenomenal amount of community input that went into this plan. And I can proudly say that equity and justice are fully embedded into this plan from cover to cover. They show up in every single section. There are frameworks um, for how to not only design the plan to begin with, but to implement it in a way that truly reflects um, the lived experience and the interests of residents across the community, um, and really focusing on how can we help to repair some environmental harms of the past um, through the climate action and sustainability work um, that this plan is guiding us towards. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Director Croner to tell us more about the plan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Green Umbrella, for hosting this session tonight. Uh, and for your thought leadership, thought partnership along the way in the development of the Green Cincinnati Plan. I am Ali Croner with the city's Office of Environment and Sustainability. Uh, if you don't know us, our team is laser focused on the climate crisis and how it will impact city government and our operations, how it will impact the people who live here, our economy, and what we're gonna do about it. And so tonight's session is what we're gonna do about it. So I think at this point, I don't even really have to cover this. I used to have to spend a lot of time on what climate change looks like in Cincinnati, but I think you know, right? We're, we're in the middle of record setting heat across the globe, historic levels uh, around, the, around the world. We are experiencing some of the worst air quality we've ever experienced in the city of Cincinnati coming from the Canadian wildfires. And we've seen the storm events, right? We've seen the landslides, we've seen the sewer backups. These are taking major tolls on our public health, on our city budget. So we need action. Fortunately, we live in a city that is taking this seriously, dating back to 2008 when Cincinnati was among the early adopters of climate action planning, uh, measuring where our carbon comes from and developing a long-term plan to address the climate crisis and reach towards decarbonization. The science keeps changing. We have political uh, fluctuations, I'll put it, at the national level uh, and some changes at the local level. And more and more, we have technologies coming forward that will help make these transformations happen. So we've found the need to update this body of work on a five-year rhythm, most recently in 2023. In order to talk about 
decarbonizing, we have to know where our carbon comes from. So one of the roles of our office, office is to model the carbon emissions of the city of Cincinnati. And at a high level here, we emit together about 6 million tons of carbon each year. About a third of that comes from our transportation sector and about two thirds comes from the energy we use to power, heat, cool our buildings. I wanna point out that city government accounts for almost three and a half percent of our carbon emissions. So city government can do this carbon planning on our own, but it won't get us to where we need to be. We are attempting to lead by example, but really this is all hands on deck, we need you. And we don't have all the ideas. We need the best from our community. So at the outset of this process, uh, the mayor appointed a steering committee, uh, which was chaired by our very own Councilwoman Owens, we'll hear more from here in a moment, who convened institutional figureheads from around the city to give shape to our community engagement process. And this went by in a blink, uh, actually in a year, but we held more than 42 public meetings, uh, bouncing around the city, hearing from different community voices. All in all, more than 1,600 residents participated and we had more than 3,000 ideas come forward from our community. One thing I really wanna highlight is we did a lot of targeted community engagement. So building from what we call our climate equity indicators work where we did some assessment of where we have climate vulnerability uh, across our city from neighborhood to neighborhood. We identified communities that needed more uh, nuanced, more tailored approach. And in partnership with Green Umbrella, Groundwork, Ohio River Valley, and the University of Cincinnati, we embarked on what was called the Climate Safe Neighborhoods Workshop Series. And these were deep dives into communities most at risk, where we were able to, with the help of city council, pay community members to participate. You know, folks who don't usually get to come to city hall to give voice, we were able to pay them, honor their lived experience as expertise in addressing the climate crisis on the ground in their communities. And through this workshop series, you can see this map. We developed these community maps, community resilience maps, where neighborhood members were able to identify where they were experiencing extreme heat or where they were having trouble accessing the bus system, where they're experiencing food deserts, and then offer their ideas of what solutions look like. And armed with this granular on the ground information, we're better able to directly address the needs of the community. And then we had to tie all that input together, taking leadership from the mayor and council, taking input from our steering committee and our public engagement and frontline community sessions and weave it all together into our best and brightest ideas. For the first time ever in 2023, the Green Cincinnati Plan accelerates and intensifies our efforts to achieve carbon neutrality. So we've always had an 80% decarbonization strategy by 2050. We are now seeking carbon neutrality by 2050. And that aligns with the global science and the UN accords around decarbonizing. We organize the components of the plan into these eight focus areas. I will let you read those on your own. But basically looking at where our carbon comes from, where we have the biggest opportunities to make an impact, and then also thinking about who is impacted and who benefits from different programs and how we need to adapt to the changes we are experiencing in real time and how we expect them to change moving forward. So to highlight some of the top level themes of the Green Cincinnati Plan, number one, we know we need to move away from fossil fuels. So we need to shift to 100% clean energy. As part of that, that means moving away from natural gas and petroleum. So we need to electrify. We can see that happening, happening with our vehicles. We also need to electrify our buildings. And we have a lot of them that are using a lot of natural gas. This is a, a major challenge for us moving forward. We know we need to make it easier to live in Cincinnati without a car. That means easier to walk around your community, bike around your community, easier to use the public transit, transit system. We need to think about our zoning policies, work that Councilman Keating has helped lead. 
thinking about density as one of our primary climate tools and thinking about how we can use density to actually improve our bus system. We need to budget for climate work. We've seen some of the federal funding coming forward. There's a Justice 40 component that requires 40% of that funding land in the communities that need it most. How can we reflect those federal priorities and make those dollars land on the ground here in our community? We need to make major investments in green infrastructure. Trees solve a lot of our challenges. Uh, so we can think about large scale projects like Lick Run led by Metropolitan Sewer District. And we can think about smaller scale projects like street trees that one by one account to something much larger that helps cool our city during our heat emergencies and helps soak up water during our storm events. We need to continue to march towards a circular economy, eliminating waste from our systems. Strong focus on expanding the recycling program into multifamily buildings, which are somewhat left out from our current program. And strong focus on expanding organic waste solutions, which contribute so much methane to our greenhouse gas emissions. And then we have a major opportunity in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which was rolled out by the federal government. Major incentives for city governments to take advantage of some of the tax credits that were never available to us to expand renewable energy and battery backups and electric vehicle charging, but also major incentives for you. And we need to do a great job of getting the word out into the community, partnering with organizations like Green Umbrella to help our community partners understand how they can take advantage of this once in a generation opportunity before us. And if there's one thing we heard from all of the communities we talked to, green jobs, I think people can sense there's a, a shift happening and they wanna be a part of the economy of the future. And frankly, if we wanna do all of this work, we need more people to make it happen. So every grant we are pursuing right now, there's a strong jobs focus. So the plan was adopted in April of 2023 and proud to say we are full steam ahead. Just to highlight a few of the accomplishments to date already, uh, last week, we completed construction on 35 megawatts of solar that will power all of our city facilities on a sunny day and save us pretty significant dollars over time. We have successfully secured $1.2 million to help address our brownfield sites in environmental justice communities. This is removing environmental contamination from uh, some of our old industrial presence in the lower Mill Creek Valley. We secured $1.1 million in partnership with Green Umbrella uh, to install heat pumps in some of over the Rhine community housings, affordable housing units. And uh, with the help of Councilman Owens, we established the Green Cincinnati Fund. So this will be a fund based out of Greater Cincinnati Foundation that will help us plant seeds of funding to smaller climate equity innovation projects. I'm very excited to say that we are right now hiring for three FUSE fellows. These will be senior level folks invited to join our team uh, to help accelerate our clean energy work, help accelerate our green jobs work, help accelerate green infrastructure work. Be on the lookout for that. The jobs are posted. And now recognizing that this is work that we can't do alone, we are actively building our champions list. These are organizations who are committing to help make different components of the plan happen. So you can see some of our, our allies already listed here. If you were part of an organization, that is not listed here, would love to have a conversation with you about formal partnership to make this all happen. And the full plan is available at greensincentiplan.org, which is listed there at the bottom of the screen. It's a great entryway to see the full body of work and also track our progress. We just released what we call our Climate View Dashboard, which will let you see all 130 strategies we are working on where we're seeing progress and how they contribute to our big picture long-term carbon neutrality goal by 2050. So with that whiplash overview of the Green Cincinnati Plan, uh, we have some of the key folks who helped give shape to this on the call today. And I, out the gate, I wanna give a deep thanks 
to our council members and our commissioner, if she is here with us. Not sure if Commissioner Driehaus has joined us yet. That's okay. We'll we'll roll with this and she, she is here in the audience, and I'm trying to get her as a, to promote it as a panelist. She'll be with us soon. Okay, great. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I understand that the commissioner was called to duty out of town, so she's fielding this panel from the airport as if the airport wasn't stressful enough already. So I admire her for being here. So I, we'll start with you, Councilwoman Owens, and then this question is to all of our panelists. Um, Councilman Owens, you were here from the start as the chair of our steering committee. You've seen this body of work come to fruition. Now, what do you see as the most exciting opportunities in the recommendations and priority actions of the 2023 Green Cincinnati Plan? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, Green Umbrella, for convening us and sharing, uh, you know, convening us over this platform. I am honored to be with my colleagues, Councilwoman Keating and Commissioner Driehaus. Um, and of course, it's always great to be with Director Croner and Ryan and Charlie. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, just the essence of how we're getting to where we're going. And I think it's important to call out really some things that you've, you've already touched on or Ryan touched on, and that is the essence of equity in this plan as we move forward. It is the recognition that knowing uh, to really see true impact, we have to recognize that there are disparate, disparate outcomes in uh, communities and frontline communities, black communities, brown communities, low income communities. And so that means we have to think differently in terms of how we allocate resources. And so that allows us to get to things like warm up Sensi programs that allow us to reduce energy poverty, um, solarize Sensi, like all of these pieces matter. And so another part of the essence of doing this work is the collaboration that it takes to get there. And so now that we have these amazing recommendations, it's really about the champions that are going to carry these uh, priority actions on. Now, if I were to get a little more granular and talk about uh, some, some things that I get excited about, which is the entire plan so it's hard to like just pick one or two things but I think there's real opportunity of, around waste diversion and and zero waste as a city I think you have a city and a county um, and a business community that is starting to align on what these priorities are um, how technology can support us in that and of course the work that councilwoman Keating has been leading on in terms of litter and hackathon these are really exciting innovative opportunities uh, I think uh, the recommendation around 4,000 jobs workforce development that is going to put us in a place of having an advantage in this region. Um, and that's really exciting, knowing that we're preparing people for the jobs that are available right now and the ones in the future. I also think um, in terms of a theme, I always love to say go big or go home. And so when I think about the two largest places where we emit um, carbon emissions, and that is transportation and buildings, I think about the federal dollars that give us such an advantage on even reaching some of these priorities. When we're thinking about benchmarking and understanding what buildings are really emitting um, and using platforms and software and technology to do that, um, when we're looking at uh, you know multimodal transportation and the opportunity that the the federal dollars, the, the infrastructure law, is going to help us to design that, that city of the future. So when we're looking at building out the crown network, um, that becomes really important. And supporting SORTA and Metro in this next phase of bus rapid transit, all of these things become important. And what the IRA is going to help to do for not only organizations, but also families. So there's a lot, I, and I can go on and on and on. Um, but those are some things that, that uh, I get really excited about. Your excitement is contagious. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, great. I see Commissioner Driehaus is with us. Good job. <laughs> Commissioner, did you catch the question? Well, I caught the answer. So <laughs> so let, let me just say what I think um, is the, the point of it. And I apologize. Um, I actually I was at the White House for a mental health parity uh, announcement by President Biden. So um, I, it's the best excuse ever to be late to a call. So, uh, but I apologize for, for the inconvenience. So, you know, from the county perspective, 
Um, we are looking forward to ongoing collaboration with the city. Um, one of the major pieces that the county has done is pass our solid waste plan. And so all we're about, we're poised to have 49 uh, jurisdictions in Hamilton County uh, approve of it. I think we're at 46 right now, so we're almost there. Um, but that plan is a blueprint for us moving forward. And it talks about um, recycling, about uh, engaging the business community and working to do more by way of diverting trash from the landfill. It also talks about the potential for an organics facility, which would be a joint effort between the city and the county um, for us to divert organics from the landfill, which would be a, a tremendously helpful step in trying to get uh, you know, length in the life of the landfill and, and get the uh, organics out of the landfill. So that is a pretty important step. That study is being conducted as we speak, um, should be done in about a year's time. And then we can talk about siting and about perhaps the private sector partnering with us, but really moving on food waste and yard waste and some of the things that are uh, very manageable, I think, from our perspective in, in um, collaboration with the city. And then the other thing that, you know, again, a collaboration with the city is uh, related to transportation. As Councilmember Owen said, um, we've got tremendous opportunity with SORTA and all the dollars that are flowing in from the levy, and they're, they're doing exciting things. We also have opportunities to partner with them and Greater Parks, uh, Hamilton County Great Parks, with uh, bike trails and bike lanes. And so this multimodal um, emphasis when it comes to some of these dollars that the voters put in place to help with those very kinds of things. And so I'm pretty excited about the Mill Creek corridor being activated by a bike trail that will connect communities of color and communities that are have traditionally been challenged and underinvested in and trying to make sure that what that artery going through the center of the county, through the city, up into the county, gets some attention, and then starts to connect the east to the west to the north. And I, I really am excited about the potential. And so the county is putting aside 500000 every year at, at, so far um, for the effort to try to activate that trail. I love that. And I want to reinforce the Lower Mill Creek Basin as a priority area of focus. You'll, you'll find that uh, theme across the Green Society plan. So I think there's alignment here between the city and county. Uh, yep. Commissioner, I don't know if you caught it, but we were singing your praises at your ability to take this call from the airport <laughs> uh, and, and the stress of the airport compounding all that. So thank you for, for making it work. Thanks, Ali. And thanks to everybody on the call. And thank you for organizing. Councilman Keating, where yes. are your areas of most excitement for the Green Society plan? Uh, I am I'm very similar to to my colleagues on here. I've got a long list, a long laundry list of things that I'm very excited about. Um, but first, I, I do want to do my thank yous as well. Thank you to Green Umbrella for for organizing this and Director Croner, um, your leadership of the city, your leadership on Green Cincinnati plan and moving us forward. For Councilmember Owens, you put in a significant amount of work and also to your team. Um, Monica and Bridget and Tanya, um, who have put a significant amount of work into this to make sure things continue to run, and Commissioner Driehaus for being a phenomenal partner. I think the most successful um, jobs we can, or the most successful we can be in government is when we have strong relationships with other levels of government and collaboration. Um, and so, so your your partnership here um, speaks volumes about you as a leader, but also um, is really what has been able to propel us to get to this point with this plan and, and very ambitious goals. Um, and also kind of cool you spent the morning with the president and not finishing with this. Um, but if, back to what I'm really excited about, I think the number one thing is the business case for it. This, this is a really, really, really strong return on investment for our taxpayer dollars. Um, we, you know, he, Director Croner talked about the solar farm. Um, he did the math for me and we've already saved um, $1.1 million in energy costs just having that. Um, and that, that savings will continue um, and to compound over time so we can spend those dollars elsewhere in, in some of our major um, areas of need throughout our city because we have so many challenges as a city. So being able to take dollars from one place and be able to invest them elsewhere through savings where you're also doing good for the environment and good for our health um, is a very, very good and positive thing. Um, also, as we look at things like brownfields and abandoned buildings, um, getting much better land use, healthier land use, 
building up neighborhoods um, and being able to get a better return on investment in, in that regard as well. I think it's huge for our taxpayer dollars and I'm very, very excited about that. And the other aspect um, that Director Croner alluded to um, is the density piece. Um, I have long been a proponent for density, particularly as we are talking about our housing crisis. We need to build more housing in our city um, and we need to be able to be smart about it as well. And so looking at how it's going to be able to positively impact our environment, um, help people with affordability because we can build along public transit lines as SORTA um, continues to invest because of the tax dollars um, from issue seven, as Commissioner Driehaus um, mentioned. We can attack a housing crisis. We can attack a health crisis. We can work on the racial disparities, the, the wealth disparities, um, and, and make a much healthier environment for our city as we do that. And what does density mean? It does not mean um, big towers on your cul-de-sac. What we're looking at is, is building up more housing for it closer together um, so you don't have to drive long car rides to get to and from places and build lots of parking lots to be able to, to handle commuters. It's building, um, I think the, the lowest hanging fruit for density is building your, our missing middle, which is your two, three, four families um, along public transit routes um, that fit into the character of neighborhoods, but also be able to build more housing to attack that housing crisis um, and make it easily accessible to pu our public transit lines to get people to and from work, school, health systems, and all of the above. Um, so again, I could go on and on all day long, but I'm most excited about the return on investment and um, our ability to tackle the housing crisis um, as we look at building more missing middle. Great answer. Certainly plenty of data to support density as one of our primary climate policy tools. Thank you for championing that. Uh, and when we talk about the business opportunity, I don't know if people appreciate yet how much the Inflation Reduction Act changes the equation in terms of the return on these investments. Um, and again, that's true at city government level, it's true for businesses, and it's true for households. So for those on the call, I really encourage you to think about your home and where you're preparing to make the next investments and looking at the incentives there because they are very powerful and uh, will really help us take major steps towards electrification. I'm going to ask uh, a two-part question next, but before I do that, I want to tee up the audience to start getting your questions ready, because after this, I'll hand it over to you all, and you can ask your questions of our panelists. Uh, and to start this question, Commissioner Driehaus, last time we spoke, you reminded me of the number of jurisdictions in Hamilton County, but I don't have that at the top of my head. Is that one you have memorized? 40, there I do. Uh, there are 49 jurisdictions in Hamilton County. 49 jurisdictions in Hamilton County. And... Ryan, can you remind me how many counties are part of your scope? Yeah, Green Umbrella serves a 10 county region, which has over 180 local governments in it. So we've seen some good progress here in Cincinnati. When you look at the track record here, we are experiencing decarbonization. We are experiencing economic growth in the green sector. Now looking forward to our panelists, where are the challenges and opportunities in collaboration between city and, counts, city and county? And where are the opportunities to think about this at a regional level where we live in a tri-state area with three different state governments? Who would like to start there? I'm, I'm happy to start. Great. Only because I keep muting and unmuting, so it's just easier for me to start. Um, so I, you know, I, I didn't talk any about housing, but uh, both council members Keating and Owens did. And so let me just say that we are also collaborating with the city to take a regional approach to housing. Um, and you mentioned the Infrastructure Act, but the, the other piece of uh, legislation that came down from the federal government was the American Rescue Plan, which allowed us to invest in housing in a way that we've never been able to do before. Uh, and so the county put in 40 million, the city put in, and I don't remember how much, but a significant amount with the private sector um, into CDF so that we can have a fund of funds and use those dollars and exponentially grow the housing market in Hamilton County. The first tranche has gone out 500 units will um, 
be built uh, with a variety of different partners. Um, some are single family, some are high density buildings, um, depending on where they are. But it is a, another example, I think, of not only city county collaboration and creating the fund of funds together, but also the federal government um, coming in with those dollars from the American Rescue Plan to allow us the opportunity to really create some change in Hamilton County. And I expect we're, um, we're gonna get state tax credits too. So it's really, uh, it's all over the map when it comes to governments collaborating on, on housing. I'll go next. So uh, challenges and, and opportunities. So, you know, I'm a proverbial optimist. So I always think of what we can do. And so these are very lofty goals, but I think what's going to maybe challenge us is the requirement that it takes for us to, to uh, think differently about policies, about how we allocate resources to even achieve these goals. And so, for example, um, if we're talking about, one, to even get the work started of uh, the Green Cincinnati Plan refresh, we as a council uh, allocated $4 million in historic investment to do this work and to be able to do this at a granular level. So one of the most important roles that we have on city council is the allocation of budget. And so when we're thinking about how we build capacity um, and support advocacy around this issue, that's gonna be important to making those intentional decisions. It's gonna be important to uh, collaborate with other systems when we're thinking about education and green schoolyards and CPS, um, us all working together as we, uh, you know, protect public lands, but also make them as educational spaces. You know, finally, how we think about building, train the trainer, right? And so if we're thinking about the future, and one of the recommendations is making sure we are training up 25 community, frontline community members to be the next uh, cohorts of, of folks that carry on the Green Cincinnati plan. It's about being able to support that infrastructure with dollars. And so I'm really excited to get there. Same thing with the 4,000 jobs. That requires intentional infrastructure that we're going to build. And so who's going to champion and how we're going to pay for it. So we've got to make um, important budgetary decisions. I think what's important, um, what are opportunities um, as we move forward regionally, is that this plan, both, both the city and the county even having a plan, a blueprint to, to go after is important. The Green Cincinnati plan is built on community engagement. And so when we think about that kind of advocacy, and we then we think about, well, what do we need to advocate for at the state level to make these things possible as well and sustainable as well? I I think those are the opportunities that we have moving forward, in addition to the technology that could hold us accountable to the results, like using climate view as it relates to where are we making progress in, in carbon reduction. And that regional collaboration, because this is about people, uh, because this is about policies, um, you know, all of these jurisdictions and the region coming together to then make a greater impact beyond what Cincinnati is doing, beyond what Hamilton County is doing, um, is quite um, attractive. And I think very possible as we continue to have this conversation too about climate change and its impacts and being very real about what that looks like for our communities. Well said. Councilman Keating. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, opportunities partnering with um, the county and having that regional perspective. It, it's a lot more effective, a lot more efficient. Um, and having that strong partnership um, it is a really big deal and how we are going to be able to succeed for these ambitious goals. Um, I think one of the biggest opportunities um, for that partnership are some things that we've already started um, and, and, and thanks to the county's involvement here is, is the work that we've done around innovation and the partnerships with our startup ecosystem. Um, two years ago, we started the hack with Centrifuge addressing the litter problem. Um, and even in our first year, we actually had different jurisdictions throughout Hamilton County compete with different ideas. We all struggle with the same issues and we all see it in different ways in our different communities and being able to pull those minds and expertise together um, to innovate with the innovation um, ecosystem of the city, those tech entrepreneurs who can then um, create the tech based on the ideas that we have, um, there's such a massive opportunity. This year, um, looking at recycling, um, we had competitors from all over the globe, but also again, throughout the entire region come compete. And when we come up with those innovative solutions and then build the technology um, to tackle 
um, those that that sustainable innovation, we can do it together and then we can implement it everywhere. So you have much bigger impact than just the city of Cincinnati. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that work, the partnership with all those jurisdictions um, or that surround us. Um, throughout the county and beyond, and then the work with major partners like um, our sort of ecosystem, like Centrifuge in, in 1819 in our innovation corridor um, to really drive a lot of this green technology and innovation, which again, as you talked about at the very beginning, also creates jobs um, and creates the, the, the workforce for the future. Absolutely. It definitely an inflection point for climate work with this burst of funding with some of the obvious impacts sort of slapping us in the face right now. I think there's more unified vision and effort to make some of these changes happen than, than ever before. Ryan, at this point, I'll look to you to see if there are any audience questions coming in. Great. Yeah, we have a ton. So thank you, everybody. Um, and we, we likely won't have time to cover them all, but we'll do our best. And I'm going to try to start with some of the like bigger picture questions, and then maybe we'll get more specific as we go. So kind of specifically to the point that you were just talking about, um, there was a question around, uh, you know, could you speak to resiliency in the face of flash droughts and flash flood events that, you know, this community and our neighbors have been experiencing in the last few years and how that work is being addressed through this plan. I yeah, will. I'd, be, I'd be happy to, to start with that. Um, my office has spent a lot of time on extreme storms and in partnerships with our stormwater management and MSD, which again is another great example of partnership with the county. Um, um, because of, because of the dual role uh, of those and the service areas throughout the entire region. Um, but it, it is something that um, I don't think is talked about enough is our stormwater management and MSD are extremely innovative in their approaches and they continue to invest in new pilot programs to look at ways that we can um, manage that stormwater um, runoff to, to manage our aging infrastructure and to look at green infrastructure to be able to solve um, and, and handle these extreme storms. Um, they've tested out a, a pilot program in Oakley where they can actually shut off different areas of water um, going so it's not flooding um, residents' homes that are going constantly. Um, they, they are looking at different ways that we can manage water as we are doing a lot of the road work that we do throughout the city. Um, a lot of that is championed through Green Society Plan and work with um, Director Croner and OES. Um, and um, partnerships and investment through the county um, to be able to continue that. But we're also looking at other ways that we can help homeowners um, be able to prep their homes um, as we continue to see um, the increase in extreme storms. Um, and I could go on and on and on all day. We do have resources and we can share links of some other town halls where we really get the granular on, on some of the examples and, and pilot programs that we are doing um, and, and we can share it on here as well. I'll just add to that, um, that when we think about taking action, climate action anyway, we're starting to make ourselves attractive to uh, dollars, right? And so the idea of even building resilience hubs is something that the city, we just got a grant with, and Director Croner, you can speak to more of the details, but a grant with uh, Cincinnati Zoo and the Urban League. And, and we're talking about what, what do these centers look like in communities? And you know the buildings and the structures themselves being resilient, but also places that are safe havens for folks when we are seeing these um, 100 year, storms and, and extreme weather events happening, but also the opportunity as it exists as it, around leveraging other resources, as the as council member Keating mentioned, how homeowners can prepare. And so when we're thinking about the Green Cincinnati Fund, which was a recommendation from a, a the 2018 plan, um, how can we leverage those dollars to support maybe organizations or uh, homeowners who are going to do things like bioswells and grain gardens. And so this is where it gets really, really exciting to leverage not only um, uh, dollars, but also um, expertise as it relates to community um, organizations that can do this work, and particularly in frontline communities. And I will pile on related to MSD and stormwater management. So we do have an impervious surface task force looking at the um, think parking lots uh, that dump into the system 
and create a situation where we're treating stormwater and sewage together, uh, which is unnecessary if we could just keep the stormwater out of the system to begin with. And so we're, we're not there yet. We're, we are working with MSD and we've got, we've had some hearings on this um, at our meetings. But the idea from my vantage point is not only do we um, try to incentivize somebody that owns an impervious surface to plant trees or create some kind of retention basin around that to keep the stormwater out of the system. But we also create a fee structure that responds to the water going into the system um, and have folks pay their fair share, which would likely provide relief to the homeowner that is not putting that much into the system that is paying uh, a certain base charge. But the other piece, and, and not everyone's sold on this yet, um, but why wouldn't we create then an additional fund um, that would try to go after the, um, we, we know where the hotspots are. We know where the overland flooding is. We know where the complaints come in. And so why wouldn't we create a fund that tries to correct those issues? Because these huge storms are not going away. Uh, they're getting worse. And so we need to respond to what we know and we need money to do it. And so it's the ratepayer dollars. It's just a matter of creating that fund. We, we have it for SBUs, for sewer backups. We do not have it for overland flooding. Um, and so it's a different way to think about this. It's kind of a new issue for us. Um, and we, I think we're, we're trying to think about creative ways to respond to that. The other thing is the stormwater district setting aside some of their dollars for the same purpose. And I'm pushing for that again. Um, it's a new idea, so not everyone is overly enthused about it, um, but I think it's a, an idea worth merit and we'll keep pushing. Awesome, thank you all. Um, are there specific mechanisms being done through this plan to combat racial disparities? It seems like there's a lot of targeting for more population and widespread effects. Um, is there stuff that's really addressing specific individual neighborhood focused initiatives uh, for those communities that have kind of historic racial health inequities? Well, I think one of the most important things was calling out climate equity indicators being overlaid with the Green Cincinnati plan so that we do have at least a framework to work from because we do know a snapshot of what is happening in communities as it relates to um, climate impact. And so when we know that, you know, I, I love using this example, but we know that when there's uh, some neighborhoods with 50% tree canopy and some neighborhoods who hardly have one, we should know where trees need to be planted. And so through the work of, uh, of uh, urban forestry um, and, and tools that they're able to use to be able to e e understand the, the life cycle of trees and, and where what needs to be planted, what needs to be uprooted, all of those things. Uh, it's the framework that's important. And so again, having the gravitas and the, the expertise of UC and Green Umbrella, being able to even bring that body of work together is so extremely important. I think when you look at the, the intentional programs that are addressing climate equity, again, like warm-up Cincy and Solarize Cincy, these are important, um, important uh, you know, programs and initiatives for us to continue to fund. Um, you know, as it relates to development, and we're talking about uh, denser, walkable neighborhoods, like these are the the reasons why when we're looking at neighborhoods that have more imper impervious surface uh, and less green space, these are the things that we need to be super focused on as it relates to development and projects as well. So I think that foundation is there and we just have to make policy decisions that reflect that. Can I yeah, add to and, that one? And, and build, building on that as well, as looking at um, you know the racial disparities in health um, and uh, as Council Member Owens was alluding to with the with the tree canopy, but also if you look in in a lot of our lower income neighborhoods, we have um, aging building stock. Um, we have building stock that is not taken care of. Um, we have uh, you know brown fields um, where you had the industrial use and you have environmental issues. Um, you have blighted buildings. Um, you have um, predatory landlords that have not taken care of their property. So you have kids living in mold and just um, it, terrible air quality. And then if you look back at, at CPS, I believe the number one reason for kids missing school in the CPS system is asthma um, because of asthma um, complications and symptoms. And so uh, we can work through the city through our buildings and inspections with code enforcement 
as we are continuing to invest in, in cleaning up our building stock, cleaning up our round fields, um, holding um, these landlords accountable to, to taking care of their properties um, inside and outside, um, we can change the health outcomes for these kids. Some of these kids are missing school 30% um, of the school year, and that compounds over time. And then that is a significant impact of their long-term um, education and long-term trajectory, and, and this, particularly if they're held back with health issues. So if you look at these teeny tiny little um, I, I say teeny tiny because there there's so many pieces of the screen since I planned, but it actually can have an it um, an incredible positive long term impact on so many lives, and particularly an impact um, on our low income and minority neighborhoods. And and just very briefly, I'll say that uh, we need to think strategically about the investments that we make. And um, I'll point once again to the the Mill Creek bike trail. I mean, that's a different look for bike trails. I mean, you, you, I, I'm sure you've all seen the, the uh, crown plan and it's a great plan. However, um, we need to create some additional focus for those areas that have not seen the kind of investment that others have. Uh, and so going up the Mill Creek through the Fairmounts, through Camp Washington, through um, you know, Mill Vale, through some of these communities that have been underinvested in when it comes to recreational facilities or multimodal facilities, um, it, it's, it sends a message to them that we want to invest in communities that have not seen that kind of an investment in the past and make it practical. You know, the, these, this bike trail that I'm referring to goes up the Mill Creek, but it also connects to Kroger. It, you know, it connects to places that um, folks utilize. And so we just need to be more thoughtful, I think, about um, how we invest our dollars. Great. Speak. Ryan. Yeah, go for it. Could I quickly just give kudos to Ashley Young, who chaired our equity committee for the Green to Think Plan uh, and really championed racial equity as a major component of the focus. And we've talked about the climate equity indicators, which is our data set. Uh, the step from there was the equity framework, which is available as part of the appendix of the Green Society Plan. And I, I apologize, I didn't get to focus on that in my quick overview, but I would invite anyone who's really interested in the intersection of racial equity and climate equity to take a close look at that because that is the framework with which we are approaching this body of work. Right. Um, so we've heard a couple specific neighborhoods mentioned uh, and one of our attendees asked, you know, how do you envision individual communities like community councils, sustainability committees, other groups, tying into this plan? Are there specific initiatives or projects that you envision neighborhoods taking the lead on? That is a great question. And I would say, you know, I think one of the opportunities with passing this uh, current Green Cincinnati plan is making sure we're having continuous ongoing conversation around our progress. And so one of the first things I think is, read the plan and dig into it. And where do you see yourself fitting in? Because that's really the type of all hands on deck that we're going to need at the individual level, at the um, organizational level, at the community level, at the business level, like everyone taking a part in this. And so I, I think that would be an interesting start to a conversation of where do you see yourself invested? And community gardens, I think that's one of the most low hanging fruit opportunities too. you know, I think every community 52 of them, um, we should all have access to a, a great community garden so I think that's one of uh, a good starting space as well. Great and if it's okay i'll ask another question does that work for everybody or does any, if others want to chime in here too, I can pause. Can I just quickly say that multiple communities and community councils have reached out to us. And we've have had conversations about direct ways to partner, direct opportunities. So if that's of interest to any of your communities, we are more than happy to do that. Great. There was also a number of questions about how individuals can engage. And I'm gonna kind of column a couple of them together. Um, one is around like, what can individuals do? You know, What are the top three things that individuals in the city of Cincinnati can do to support the goals of the Green Cincinnati Plan? And is there or will there be a resource or a website or something that lets people know of all the different incentives and resources available that would help them take action? I'll take a stab first. And mine is pretty simple because, again, I think it's 
behavior change and the simplicity that we can all do something right now, and that is recycle. Um, you will be so surprised if you do not recycle um, that you will start recycling more than what you throw away. So you are already being a champion of waste diversion. Um, if you don't have a green bin, call us up and we will make sure that you get one. Uh, in terms of the information on the website, you know, Director Croner, you might have some more specifics, but I, I know the plan is there. Um, so people being very familiar with that. And, you know, again, I think ongoing conversation and, and like progress on the plan, but perhaps there is opportunity to further kind of parse out, uh, here are direct pieces and resources um, that people should be connected to or, or tap into, kind of aggregated in one area. That might be a, a simplistic kind of step. Yeah, and now um, I'll also build on that. I think that it just reminds me of one of my favorite quotes that if you think you're too small to make an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito in the room. You can, you can make it, you can make a huge impact and, and it's those little baby steps um, every single day as Council Member Owens was talking about is changing um, or enhancing your recycling habits. Um, it's walking to work um, a, a day or two a week or riding your bike. Um, it, for those of you who are parents, I have small kids, it's already starting to talk to them and help them understand, um, you know, the difference between waste and recycling and, and um, more sustainable living, um, reusing grocery bags. Um, but also, I don't know if, um, Ollie, you can go back to that first slide of where you see the biggest impact. It's our, it's a, it's our, our corporations, our corporate partners. If you work for a company in Cincinnati, being that voice inside the company, um, talking about ways that you and, and your company can make a bigger impact and help us reach these goals. Because the city is only 3.62% of this. We need the entire community. We need our corporate partners. We need um, all of businesses throughout the city to make those changes. And having that voice inside and that advocate inside can go a really long way because you can see in this graph um, the impact that that can make. Maybe you all remember when the US withdrew from the Paris Accord, there was quite a bit of conversation around whether we could still hit our goals. Uh, and there was a study done that basically asked the question, if the federal government took no action, could we as individuals still get there? And the organization RMI said we can, if every household in America purchased an EV as their next vehicle, purchased a heat pump as their next furnace air conditioner, and found a way to procure renewable energy. Today, you see the Inflation Reduction Act and what's incentivized there, electric vehicles, renewable energy, and home electric electrification efforts, including heat pumps. So I fully recognize that those are big ticket items and they're not easy to just do. Uh, but they're also likely to be expenses that you will face in your lifetime. So the more you can plan to play your part in those categories, the more helpful. And we as a city are working to make that easier. Uh, lower hanging fruit would include looking at your diet and the carbon impact of your diet and focusing on eliminating food waste. As we heard from Commissioner Dree, House Organic Waste is such a, a major part of our challenge. And if you haven't lately, try riding the bus. Make, making major improvements to the bus system, uh, both in usability and frequency, uh, it's right there for us to use. Please give it a shot. So one additional thing. So Hamilton County Resource has grants available for communities that want to create common composting facilities. And so that is something that a community can do uh, to come together and take advantage of that. I do wanna say, as I listen to the, the council members and I listen to what individuals can do, what county communities can do, uh, it reminds me that government, um, what we can do is try to build the bike path so you can take your bike to work, right? So what we can do is provide grants so that you can, you can do composting. And so this is this partnership between what we are trying to prioritize, helping uh, create the partnership with individual citizens so that you can do more um, by way of living a sustainable lifestyle. So I, I, it's, it's an exciting opportunity at this moment in time to create these partnerships to allow people to do more. Um, and so it, it's, it's great that there's such enthusiasm 
to do it, right? Because I think we're starting to build the infrastructure through the Green Cincinnati plan at all um, to provide what we can as an infrastructure so the people can do more. And I'll just add to that, it is an exciting time because to the earlier question, you know, when we're talking about both resources at the city and the county, and then being able to overlay them both, and, and we are making targeted investments, right, like community members that are in frontline communities actually are taking advantage of things that are happening at the city and at the county. So I feel like there's an idea of how do we aggregate all of these resources on, on one Green Cincinnati, Hamilton County uh, landing page. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, I will throw one other question out there for now, and then we'll do a little wrap up in a minute. Um, and this kind of ties into what some of our existing resources are. So, you know, we know that the greenest building is the one that's already built because of all the carbon and, and work that materials that went into building it. What is the city doing and thinking about to encourage the preservation and reuse of historic architecture in the quest to resolve the housing crisis? Um, what incentives and support can the city provide? And then I'm gonna tag in a like, what are some of the technologies we can be looking at that are helping to make these historic buildings uh, less expensive to maintain and uh, particularly around energy use? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start in terms of um, what we're doing to incentivize. Um, council just um, restructured our residential tax abatements, um, the, the layout for that and incentives um, for building and investing in Cincinnati. And one of the um, pieces of that is that it's, you get higher incentives if you're renovating and keeping a house versus tearing something down and building something brand new. Um, yes, we do have incentives if, if you're lead platinum and other things, because that does impact um, the community and, and our, our infrastructure, um, but the, high, the incentives are higher um, if your home is so old and, and you're renovating rather than tearing down um, so that we can try to encourage more people um, to, to keep the buildings up and, and to continue to invest and renovate those and, and keep them um, in good standing too, so that we don't have um, buildings falling apart and turning into blight and bringing down our neighborhoods. Um, and I, I do think there is a lot more that we can do and, and things that I would love to see is how we can track buildings and keep them, especially these old historic buildings from completely falling part that it is then way too expensive to try to um, renovate and bring back online that we just can't put the financing together to do something like that. Yeah, and I'll just add on um, that we do, there are things that we need to work on to make sure we're being proactive in the beginning so that we are saving structures that are historic that could be turned into housing uh, developments that, that we know we need. And so I, I think there's, again, a shift of, of policy um, and direction that we are going to need. Um, but also, how do we couple these things with existing grants and programs that can help um, reduce energy costs and you know install the solar panels, all of those pieces. But yes, definitely work in making sure we are proactively kind of saving uh, this kind of stock. And, and as far as the housing piece goes, you know, uh, some of the dollars that we provided or, or rather we're, we're putting out from the American Rescue Plan, it's not all new housing. Some of it's rehab. Uh, that's an intentional choice for us to say we've got housing stock. It needs to be rehabbed. We don't need to build all new. Uh, we can use what we've got, uh, you know, Ryan, to your point, um, to take advantage of the housing stock that's throughout the county that can be rehabbed and put into good use. And a lot of that work is done with the land bank and the port um, to, to save those housing structures and bring them back online. And a lot of that work is then then the, the cost to, to do that is absorbed by entities like the port um, so that we can then sell them at a, at a lower level market rate in those neighborhoods so it's affordable for anybody um, to be able to, to purchase and, and to live in. Awesome. And I will add that um, one of the grants that Ollie mentioned earlier is a research grant that um, Green Umbrella partnered with the city and over the Rhine community housing around to not only make improvements uh, to electrify some of the historic building stock that over the Rhine community housing manages for low-income residents, but also to look at what are the um, air quality impacts, the behavior impacts, the comfort impacts of having increased energy efficiency and 
um, reduction in, in gas usage within those homes. So we're exciting. This is really like innovative research that's going to be happening locally that can inform then what happens across the nation as we continue to invest in this type of work. Which also adds to housing affordability, because yes. when you can drive down the cost of utilities, you make things more affordable. So green living is affordable living and it's good for everyone. Amen. Um, well, one of the questions that came up from a few folks that I just want to speak to briefly is that uh, they were asking, you know, this is amazing. All this work is happening inside of the Cincinnati, inside the city of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, but how do we see it expand uh, to a broader footprint? There were questions about Indiana and Kentucky and our, our neighboring communities. Um, and so the good news is there is work happening to do that. Um, Green Umbrella manages the Regional Climate Collaborative, which is in the process of launching. And it is a way to bring resources and create collaborative uh, cross-sector impact happening with local governments and other organizations across Green Umbrella's 10-county footprint. Um, the city of Cincinnati is one of the founding members of it, but we have lots of other communities that are engaged. And um, we're really excited to be able to bring this type of climate planning, sustainability planning work that has been um, so essential to the city for the last decade plus um, to the region as a whole and also to the many smaller communities that make up our region. So we are gonna be sharing much more about that. We have a big event coming up on October 18th that we'll send out more information on that talks more about what that looks like and how to get involved. Um, but Savannah Sullivan is somebody you can reach out to now on our team to learn more. Um, are there any other announcements from our panelists of, of ways that folks can take immediate action or stay engaged in the next few months? At every opportunity like this and beyond other convening formats, make sure you show up and, you know, take away one behavior change that you are going to do as a result of, of being here today or hearing something new. Again, you know, I, I still have to get my electric bike. So, you know, these are things that, you know, when I think about using other means of transportation. So I think we all just have to come to a place of where, where are we challenging ourselves the most to be able to save our planet. Yeah, and I, I, I will, I'm going to take a composting class over at the Civic Garden Center. Mika, I'm just now noticing your background. Um, so <laughs> I don't know where you are. Like, I'm in an airport, but you, you're in like the Bahamas. What the heck, man? Um, so, no, and I, I think, um, you know, kudos to Green Umbrella, to the Green Cincinnati Plan, to Ollie, to, to those that continue to push, 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 engage, 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 um, and make sure that the partnerships are robust. Uh, when it comes to the city, the county, and beyond. Um, but yeah, uh, we all need to take our, and I'm trying to become more sustainable by having a, a garden that produces food. Uh, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> the tomatoes are coming, I think. Um, so anyways, uh, but I do want to um, thank you for the opportunity for the county to participate. Um, it is a collaboration, and I'm, and I'm grateful to have the chance to talk to everybody. And I will add um, to look up connected communities, um, the work that is being led by council member Reggie Harris, um, that is looking at density and looking at zoning, building more housing um, along public transit lines and taking advantage of um, the investment that SORTA is making and kind of that regional view um, as we address the housing crisis and expand public transit um, and more sustainable, healthy communities. Um, there are so many ways for people to get involved um, as an individual, as a neighborhood community council, um, as, a, as a group of friends or advocates who wanna get engaged, um, look up Cincinnati's Connected Communities and you can see all the information there. Um, and just shout out to council member Reggie Harris um, for leading the charge there and the impact that it's gonna have on Green Cincinnati Plan. Awesome. Uh, and there were so many questions that we didn't get a chance to launch to our panelists tonight. We will see what we can do about creating a uh, question and answer sheet that goes out when we um, send this recording out. Um, but thank you so much for your truly engaged participation from our panelists and from our audience today. Thank you, Director Croner, for moderating. Um, and we're so excited that this plan is in action. Uh, and please stay in, stay in touch about how to get engaged. Have a great night. Good night. Good night. So much fun. Thank you. <laughs>